Welcome one and all, we are the Brothers Mahoney. I am Michael. And I'm James. And today we are discussing the film manga, which is the fifth release from the Big Finish main range. It's telling the Seventh Doctor, of course being Sylvester McCoy, and Ace, being Sophie Aldred. It was released February 2000 and written by Jonathan Blum. To quote the plot from BigFinish.com, one would-be assassin is in a mantle ward, another's on the run. The intended victim is tearing up the mobs. Terrorists are planning a strike of their own. A talk radio host is loving every minute of it. A white howl insider whispers about a mysterious UN operative with a hidden agenda. Everyone's got someone they want to be afraid of. It will only take a little push for the situation to erupt, and something is doing the pushing. But you can't trust the doctor to put things right, can't you? This is only the fifth audio story we've listened to from Big Fairness, of course. And it was our first story where it featured the seventh doctor just by himself. He, of course, showed up in The Silence of Time as one of the uh, doctors. But this is the first, first story we've gotten from him. And all in all, I thought it was quite fun. There's a lot of interesting things about this story, such as Ace meeting up with an old friend of hers, who she hasn't seen in a while. And it was actually very much like survival in that aspect. But there is something really interesting, because Ace says that she hasn't met this guy in, I don't know, I, I know she gives a year. Does that mean it is now literally impossible for her to go back, you know, and meet him any time in between when she supposedly hasn't met him? I would imagine so. Yeah, you see what I mean. Oh, actually, if we want to do that. I'm just saying, like, you know, I mean, like Rose could go back five months before she got back a year after. So, I mean, speaking, she never asked the doctor. Maybe well, she, doctor- thought she thought it was just a couple. Well, that's true. But she probably realized that other would have worked. But yeah, the film manga has a lot of interesting things in it. And I think it's, in my opinion, one of the better audio dramas we've listened to so far. The story starts out in Media's Race, which is a fancy way of saying without preamble. We're sort of just thrown into this toy. I mean, for some reason, Ace is talking to this one random friend of us. The doctor just pops up in the middle of some talk radio show. We as an audience have absolutely no idea why. And it just sort of throws us in then, you know, over the course of the story, we naturally learn more of what's going on. And I think I think it's really fascinating. It feels a lot more frantic, more involved. It draws you in a lot quicker than just a, hey, let's land here and wait five times to see what's actually going on. So I thought it was interesting. And mixed in with all the fear mongering and stuff, there's a lot of political things going on here. And a conservative party leader of the New Britannia party rallying up people, giving speeches, quite blunt speeches, about what she sees as the problems the country is facing. So you combine that with the frantic feel of the story, the, the politics that the story doesn't really shy away from, I know this story just had, in my opinion, a decent amount going for it. Yeah, I might have enjoyed the land of the dad a little more, but we can get into that as uh, we progress. But no, yeah, this one started off quick, uh, as uh, Michael said. Uh, well, it starts off with a quick scene with uh, two assassins. But once you get past that, it's about, I think, a, a week later or so. And we're like in a, just with a radio host. Yeah, the radio host was... Uh, Mick Thompson, played by uh, Vince Henderson, certainly didn't support the uh, New Britannia leader, Cyril and Halpo, which, of, and of course, New Britannia is Microsoft, is a right-wing party. And it's funny, they just, you know, sounded at first to me like a normal right-wing politics, what you'd expect to hear from a right-wing speech, if you, you know, care to listen to one, which I usually don't. But I think it was right near the end of the second episode, well, well, more like the middle of the second episode. Or was it the end of the first episode? Either way, they're listening to the speech. And, you know, she's, you know, saying horse tick. But then she throws in that, you know, she's, you know, signing up supporting God-faring, blah, blah, the usual white citizens. And that Yeah, yeah me- it, it went like God-faring, working class. Patriotic. Yeah, patriotic. And then white. I'm like, oh, God. One of them parties. I mean, that's a bit farther than normal right-wing politics in general, you know, likes to go. Although, it's getting more um, 
The, the idea has gained credence among some of the parties in recent years, but, but so yeah, that was uh, fun. I, I enjoyed in this story, Ace hated the woman. Basically, these two people attempted to assassinate her because they heard a, a voice, a kind of demonic voice from the woman, uh, which uh, turns out well, is a uh, film manga, is what the, uh, well, the, that's the name of the story. Yeah, it's like an alien organism that can sort of use people to rile up fear for its own needs. Yeah, it kind of feeds off the fear, riles up. And the way it possesses people but in a subconscious manner, where they don't know they're being possessed, which I thought was a lot more interesting than just a normal possession. It's not like Cheryl and Harvey was, you know, inside their own mind fighting to get out. No, it was just normal Cheryl and Harvey. Maybe she was a down a bit by the film angle, though maybe not, as we find out later in the story. But either way, I thought there was a more interesting uh, way to do that type of uh, story. Yeah, Ace hated her. The doctor is teaming up with one of the assassins who wasn't as the plus size in the mantle asylum. Not, of course, to help him. That's not really but, the doctor's style. But. To be fair, it's a would-be assassin since they were not able to actually succeed in their goal. Well, be that as it may, yes. But, I mean, it kind of comes down to the same. But anyway, this guy is a bit mentally disturbed, you know. Granted, he's probably under a lot of, lot of pressure. He just tried to assassinate the leader of a political party. So he's, of course, in hiding. But he uh, basically hijacks Mick. Thompson's radio, uh, he, like I said, he was just standing in the room and just uh, says, hey, Walter, who was the uh, would-be assassin, I believe you. And uh, throughout machinations with Ace um, getting the number that Walter used to call and to talk to the doctor for a bit, they're able to track Walter down. And, you know, this guy's this guy has issues, but the doctor and Ace want to, you know, kind of work with him to figure out exactly and how to deal with the um, Cyril and Halbert issue, and more importantly to them, of course, the uh, film angle, which is alien in nature, th- so the doctor has it under his um, goals, basically, to deal with. Of course, the doctor's main goal is dealing with the film angle. Uh, this is sort of an amusing discussion where Ace, like James said, Ace just cuts down Cheryl and Halbert. Halbert's just a, a right-wing nutcase. Ace does not abide that. And it harkens back, actually, to Ace's, you know, actual seasons on the show, because it mentioned the Pockies Out, which is I, it's so offensive, I don't even like saying it. And a, a convenience station that was firebombed, which is, again, mentioned previously in the uh, seasons. And, I mean, there was even, when they were back in the 60s, you know, she had the reaction to the uh, no-colored sign in Remembrance of the Daleks, which she also was very um happy about. So, yeah, she... She, she's not in the mindset to, you know, enjoy right-wing politics. But the, really, who so would be? Yeah, the amusement, though, comes from the fact that she sort of wants the doctor to do something about Cheryl and Halbert. Whereas the doctor's like, well, you, you humans have to deal with this type of thing yourself. Now, in the past, we have seen the doctor overthrow totalitarian governments, such as the Happiness Patrol. But in this case, it's a thing of, hey, you humans have to deal with this. It's a, a, one of the types of growing up. So they have sort of an interesting discussion about that. I think what toward the end of episode one, I believe. That was actually near the end of episode two, was right before they uh, go yes. to the um, park. But yeah, it was a. I mean, I'm not sure I actually agree with the doctor's position, but I guess he's not. He's right now not time of victorious, so at last he can't just do as he wishes. At least he doesn't want to do as he wishes, for the most part. But naturally, there's a whole lot of political intrigue here. Because while the doctor is working with a would-be assassin, Ace and a friend of Ace named Paul, to try to figure out a way to defeat this fear manga, which is using Cheryl and Halbe to incite fear, Cheryl and Halbe and her campaign manager, a, a Roderick Allingham, who, who, a a yeah, who had a great voice actor, by the way. He was portrayed by Hugh Walters, and he was just, every time he was on screen, well, on audio anyway, he was just... I really like listening to that guy. And he has some friends, not naturally in the government, who knew about the doctor and his time at UNIT. So because of that, Cheryl and Halbe and her campaign manager sort of think the UN is trying to interfere somehow with the political party and yeah, working which... with would-be assassins to do that, which just adds you know, another element of 
Well, as you can imagine, problematic stuff. Yeah, which would be something a far right party would be worried about because the whole globalist thing they like to carry on about. It's funny, in, in another context, there would be a left wing party afraid of that. Not so much the UN, but just the CIA. But I guess that at last was this story. Yeah, it's a story that moves pretty quickly. And there's a lot of moving parts because one of the subplots in this is uh, Paul, uh, the friend of Aces, who uh, well, she used to know and has up, up with again. He is kind of acting as a what, triple agent because he originally um, informs the uh, uh, New Britannia party that, hey, uh, the doctor and Ace are working with this guy. And he, uh, you know, get, he shouts them out. Then the doctor quickly finds out that he shouts them out. Then the doctor somehow gets him back on the doctor's side and has him walk as a mole from the inside. So yeah, it's uh, I mean that guy had a hell of a what three week period. This story took place over three or four weeks. Yeah, but then they also sort of humanizes Paul because Paul is just, from everything we can tell, a working class white guy who is sort of drawn into the idea of the New Britannia Party which is exactly the type of demographic that party tickets might appeal to. I'm not sure how much he actually fall into, you know, liking the party. Well, he More... did say that he was, he thought, hey, you know, she has some interesting things to say. Well, yeah, that's true, I suppose. He, he would be one of the people who fall into it. Yeah, it, I guess, as you said, in a more innocent way, he didn't realize or did it comprehend the more draconian parts of what of those policies would entail, I suppose. Yeah, but I have to imagine most of the people involved in the party are probably in the exact same way. I mean, if we can bring this to modern day politics, I maintain, and this may not be a popular point of view, but I maintain that majority of Trump supporters are not necessarily quote unquote bad people. Not the policies they are fighting for are definitely negative policies, but the people themselves, well, they obviously think they're doing what's best. And Powell probably thought, listening to this party, hey, they're speaking to me. And he was just like a lot of other people brought into a party that's doing a bunch of negative things, but just through, I guess, the party's ability to convince people. Yeah, well, that's what politicians do. They have messages that are trying to sway people, which works out perfectly for the film, Mango. That's another good thing that's worth mentioning. This toy works perfectly with Sebastian McCoy. It's the exact type of story that you would expect to see as Dacto in. A nice politically based story dealing with right-wing politics of fair manga. It has all the elements that you would expect from a Sebastian McCoy. So I think that just adds to the quality of this. I would have liked to see, like, Houghton deal with the situation of Troughton. Could you imagine Troughton in the film? Well, I guess Troughton did have the enemy of the world, which was sort of similar-ish. Yeah, kind of, I guess. That was more the end stage of things, not really the beginning, but that was a fun one. But anyway, yeah, the fair manga... It just, as, as Michael said, has a lot of moving parts. And I think it all works really well together. There is, they have the most boring name, a domestic terrorist group who were targeting the New Britannia party homes and you know, just, you know, like a firebombing houses, you know, that kind of thing. Um, a quote-unquote left-wing terrorist group. Uh, the, the, yeah, the, they're called the United Front, which is, I mean, even the Dr. Sass is the most boring name he could possibly imagine. Well, those were quite his words, but <laughs> that was his first reaction to the name. That was very bland. And I mean, that's not wrong. Yeah, so you have the United Front going around, sort of, well, terrorists just trying to terrorize people into not supporting the New Britannia Party. And it's just one of the other elements of the story. We even meet one of the, the leaders of the group for a bit. And even Walter, who is one of the would-be assassins, one that's working sort of working with the doctors. James has a sort of monthly disturbed, so he's not the most loyal guy you can be working with. But even he sort of joins the United Front for a bit. So yeah, like James said, there's a bunch of things going on here. And I think for the most part, it works. Yeah, I think, to me at least, the story had a lot of scenes that were really good. And I think the scenes, I don't know exactly how to phrase it, I think the scenes walk battle than the whole. Because there was a go there was a good scene with the doctor talking to Ace in the hospital after while well, Ace tries to Maggie, do I have to go uh, into this? Yes. And this is one of my uh, favorite parts of this toy. At the end of the second episode, and just if in case you're sort of confused, 
because these are, you know, of course, audio only releases. They're divided, the tracks are divided by episode. So there might be, let's say, I don't know, 25 tracks on a total release, and they'll just be divided into either four or five episodes, or however many quote unquote episodes they think need. So it's somewhat analogous to watching it on TV. Yeah, it's reminiscent. If you close your eyes and you pay attention, you could imagine like this actually, you know, happening on screen. Yeah, and a lot of them are around like the 20 to 25 minute range. So it's not really that different from what you would see watching a serialized classic who story. So at the end of episode two, the doctor, Ace, and Walter go to actually meet with the United Front, trying to sort of talk them down. I mean, the they, they already have problems enough trying to do it with the Fair Mongo and Cheryl and Halbe. Naturally, they don't need another group exacerbating the situation. So they go to meet with the United Front. And naturally, being a somewhat terroristic group, they are armed. Doctor and Ace attempt to communicate with them. Ace actually tries to talk down a somewhat unhappy guy with a gun in a scene that's extraordinarily reminiscent of the Doctor's famous speech in the Happiness Patrol. Of course, when he's talking down a sniper. Yeah, which is one of my favorite um, Sabbath Doctor scenes. So Ace is attempting to sort of... No, of course, Ace was there during that scene. But she's doing trying much the same thing, trying to talk down this guy. The Doctor sort of warns her, like, you know, be careful. Ace thinks that she can do it. She's been traveling the Doctor for quite some time. Yeah, and she, she has a great line uh, where she's like, oh, uh, cool, uh, cool down, Professor. I've gotten gold at this. <laughs> which is... Just great. Great at character building. Yeah, so Ace attempts to talk this guy down, and then the episode ends with a gunshot ringing out, and the doctor screaming, Ace! And it's just, it's beautiful. As it ends up, she got shot in the shoulder, which leads to being in the hospital for, what, two? Three weeks. Yeah, three, three weeks. weeks. Which is where this conversation James was talking about between the doctor and Ace takes place. And that seems interesting anyway, because it sort of shows Ace's confidence in doing things much like the Doctor has done. And it actually reminded me uh, briefly of Clara. And I, I hate comparing Ace to Clara. Because on the one hand, you have Ace, who's one of my favorite companions. And then you have Clara, who I just personally didn't care for. But it sort of showed Ace's confidence in trying to mimic the Doctor the same way that Clara sort of does in her later time. And it's just a interesting element that I don't think we saw. I mean, we saw Ace being pretty competent in the show, but I'm not sure we ever saw how much trying to mimic the Doctor in the show, so I did like that. No, well, not so much in that way, certainly. But yeah, with that scene at the end of episode two, we had the very fun, just again, the fun opening with the Doctor in the radio station. I do this I do this all the time. I, I forgot my point. It's never quite clear the politics of the guy, uh, Mick Thompson, who runs the radio station. Well, I guess he does attack new runner, but, you know, the radio host. He seems that he's probably a, a supporter of the Labour Party, which would be a, ne- um, a negligence to the Democrats here. But more, more, more than anything, it seems like, I guess, in America, in Norman Clinch, he seems sort of like a shock jack type guy. He's just pretty much a loud mouth with the radio, just talking. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, he, he didn't support the... Um, the right wing party, but I have a feeling that he would have supported any left wing party either. So, a, a moderate with a mouth, I guess, is how. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, he invites people to call in. He insults them if they disagree with him. I mean, he's just like what you would sort of expect from well, anybody who calls himself a shock jack. I mean, he, now that that's what he used to, but that's pretty much what it seems like. What's interesting about Mick Thompson, though, and like we said, he was voiced by a Vince Henderson. A uh, Vince Henderson. At the time, I'm, I'm not sure if he still is, but at the time, he, he was the husband of Sophie Aldred, which I thought was funny, especially because later on we do see Ace and this character, Mick Thompson, arguing with each other. Ace calls him an idiot or something like that, but it's just so funny knowing behind the scenes how these two are actually married. Well, yeah, I thought that was funny too, especially because um, well, in that radio, the very first radio scene, Ace calls in to give information to the doctor, and as he also says, oh, and Mick, I think you're an idiot and you're so sucks. It was basically what it came down to. Yeah, but Ace does have a mouth on her. So like uh, James said, Ace is in the hospital after getting shot for about three weeks. So this toy does encompass a, a somewhat longer amount of time. It's not like a, a one day and it's done type deal. And, and I don't remember, did any classic who do that? I know, of course, Marco Polo took place over his span of four months. But we've actually never listened to that one. At least not yet. 
But can you think of any other that classic Doctor Who story? Off the top of my heart, no. Though I do want to say Invasion of the Dinosaurs. Something about that. I'm not sure if it did take a while, but I remember there being a scene in the... Well, point being, we've only seen a lot of these classic Who stories once. So a refresh, of course, might be in action, but that one might have been a, a little longer than the average story. But who is to say? Well, I'm sure now that I think about it, I'm sure that, oh, the yeah, Daleks master plan, I'm sure that took place over, like, I, I'm sure that wasn't just a day. I'll phrase it that way. They've actually fit audio stories, uh, big finish audio stories, in between some episodes of that serial because of, well, how many episodes they were. Uh, that, of course, is the famous, almost completely lost 12 episode story from how knows, I believe it was third season. But what's interesting about the film manga, though, it's that while Ace is in the hospital of the doctor, still has not figured out a way to... Well, I guess technically he has figured out a way to potentially beat the film manga. Yeah, to incapacitate it. He has an idea of a force field that humans can pass through, but the film manga can't. But the problem is, the time we tried to start it up, he was sold out by the Ava Manson uh, yeah, pal. Yeah, yeah, naturally, keep in mind, this is a party leader. It's not some random guy on the street. A party leader... Not just a party leader, but a party leader who's facing attacks by a terrorist group. So this yeah, it's not like she's making public appearances out that often. Yeah, she has a lot of protection. The doctor is known now by the police. Like, hey, this guy is sort of working with the United Front. So he can't just walk up to her and deal with it that way. So while Ace is in the hospital, the doctor is still trying to figure out a way to do it. The fear mongering of the New Britannia party just keeps increasing. Riots have broken out. There's even mention of a couple other groups that pop up. One called the White Wolves, which you can imagine is a group of probably people who support the New Britannia Party. Yeah, maybe- I, mean, I mean, forget, I mean, forget New. Uh, they're probably white nationalists, probably neo-Nazi. Yeah, which means they probably support the New Britannia Party. Okay, um, I'm, but I'm just saying, though, support would they don't exist who support the uh, New Britannia Party. They're probably supporting them as a means to an end for them. And another group called Black Lightning, which is not the DC superhero, if you might be wondering. It most certainly is not. And lots it is, but I, I guess, but most likely it's not. As you can imagine with the name, they do not support the New Britannia Party. Granted, we only get a single line mentioning them, but it's fascinating. And what's fascinating to me still is this takes place in 2002. Uh, we've recently watched uh, the first episode of the Revival series, Rose which takes place in 2005. Actually speaking, I realized that, you know, the source novel really worried about canon when it comes to extended media. And to be fair, who the how could keep all of this in mind? But not three years, you know, before Rose, not that Rose would have been paying attention. She didn't seem like she was the uh, type of person to do so. And neither would Jackie have. Although, hey, about this. maybe Mickey was a member of Black Lightning in his angry youth. Maybe Mickey was. I mean, Mickey did show a lot of um, promise in uh, uh, World War Three. so maybe he was. Maybe that'll come out in the extended media. That would be fun. That would be the, t- the type of canon mod I would love. Could you imagine? But yeah, no, I mean, talking to me three years before Rose, uh, the seventh doctor was there threatening, threatening an assassination attempt. Well, I guess he did attack me throughout it. They was tapped kind of almost an accident, really. And I don't know, it's just the type of Keeping all of this stuff in mind in terms of timelines is confusing and not very rewarding because, you know, there's contradictory stuff, but nonetheless interesting, at least to me. Yeah, so while Ace is in the hospital, the doctor's trying to do stuff, all these riots are increasing and going on, and it's just not a very pleasant time. I do think this uh, story is better than Land of the Dead. At least I enjoyed it more. I, I'm not going to say what's bad and what's not. But I did enjoy this one more. I do think the last episode was maybe not quite as good as the first three, mainly because, well, actually, I'm not sure exactly why. I just didn't enjoy it quite as much as the first three. But it did throw in some, as the uh, kids say, twisty twists, which we always enjoy. Yeah, so far, um, I think Land of the Dark might have been the only one without any type of twist off the top of my heart. But you could argue that they sort of had a twist with the old guy's relationship with the well, I mean that guy and the guy who was working for him with the whole parentage. Yeah, I I I don't think that was really a twist. Like it might have been more well, than the guy twist. didn't know it. Yeah. I mean I'm not saying it's a twist that really brought the audience in that while, 
But I guess, you know, they had plenty of references to, hey, what happened in that mine all those years ago? And then we find out. And But yeah, that's naturally no one else exciting. It's what maybe Whispers of Terror did. Even The Sounds of Time, I thought was decent. Yeah, The though- Sounds of Time had a really good twist. And again, it's only four dollars. You should you should uh, listen to Sounds of Time. And the issue, by the way, if you're wondering where the twist of the film angle co- will come into, so the film angle is this entity that can sort of take someone over, and it's possible for the entity to, of course, move from person to person, which of course makes it even harder to track. So yeah, this- because, because at one um, one point in the story, when Sarah and Hobby is doing a radio interview with. Mick Thompson, which I guess that's a way to get your masters out. Ace is listening on the radio and she hears the... Again, this is... Uh, it's audio, so the way the film angle is shown, quote-unquote, is by them having a very staticky, demon-like voice over the, say, you know, over the words of the person who's actually talking. Yeah, so, so- yeah, and Ace hears the voice transfer from Sarah and Halbe over to uh, Mick Thompson. While well, she's listening to the radio while in the hospital. Yeah, so this is a section of the last couple of episodes when the Doctor and Ace don't necessarily show even exactly where the film angle is. They just know they have to find it and defeat it. And it leads to what I think is a really, really quality finale, actually, that even threw in sort of another twist, which I, I really enjoyed. It's something that I'm not going to talk about at length here, but I think if you want to. A, a quick, or maybe not quick, this one's about like an hour and 40 minutes. Yeah, it's, a, it's an hour and 40 minutes. So it may not be quick, but if you're looking to try to get into Doctor Who big finish releases, this one I think will be one good one to track, especially if you're a fan of the Seventh Doctor, because this one, as a famous song, says it takes you for a ride. I don't know how famous the song is, but you know, especially if you like the Seventh Doctor and Ace, and really, who, who does like the Seventh Doctor and Ace? This is a, a good. I, mean, I guess, to be fair, we haven't listened to any other Seventh Doctor and Ace ones. But this is certainly a good one to, a good one to start with. It's certainly, at the very least, not a bad one. And speaking of the Seventh Doctor, you just quickly place this on his personal timeline. Of course, from the TARDIS Wiki timelines page, which I have, ever since I found, I've just browsed most every day. Because I find it fascinating, the idea of trying to do a task that many would say is probably impossible <laughs> to, you know, catalog stories like this from all the extended media and put them in order. Like so many Seventh Doctor stories, this takes place after survival, which of course was the final story of the uh, classic series. And it takes place specifically in between a, a BBC past novel adventure, which was of course a, a BBC book series featuring um, previous doctors. This would have been after BBC got the rights to do novels from the Voyager novels. These Voyagers, of course, published the Seventh Doctor uh, what, New Adventures, was it? Yeah, the Voyager New Adventures. Yeah, the Voyager New Adventures, which, of course, the Seventh, Do- Seventh Doctor was the main doctor, so he was in that um, series, Past Doctor. Yeah, to, uh, to make things simple, well, uh, when, when, uh, when Voyager was publishing the books, the Seventh Doctor's Tower and the Vorchen New Adventures. And at the same time, Vorchen had another line called the Missing Adventures, which had stories that Doctors 1 through 6, of course, being William Hartnell through Colin Baker. And then when BBC took the, I guess, rights back, this is after the 1996 Doctor Who movie came out, they had the Eighth Doctor Adventures, of course, telling the Eighth Doctor, Palmer Gunn. And the Seventh Doctor was sort of thrown into the equivalent of the missing adventures being the past Doctor adventures, which had stories from Doctors 1 through 7. So a nice little, you know, quick explanation of what the books look like in the 90s. And one of the most fascinating things is when the, the books stopped shortly after, the, well, these uh, book series stopped shortly after the Revival series touted, but the 8th Doctor actually had one book in the BBC past Doctor adventure series. Because at that point, Christopher Ackerson, you know, had started being the Doctor. And so they gave him a book in the past, uh, past Doctors series. And I think that's just pretty funny. Uh, but, not only that, but the Eighth Doctor actually did get one book in the Vorchen New Adventures line. I think it was, I imagine, I imagine it's the very last book of the series. But the Eighth Doctor did technically pin one book in the Vorchen New Adventures, which is also fascinating. Oh, yeah, I actually forgot about that. 
But anyway, so this takes place out of that preamble aside. Uh, there is a BBC past novel adventures from 2000 uh, entitled Independence Day, which we actually own, which is fun. We are walking on getting a book collection. Uh, they're not cheap, so it's going to take, and there's a lot of books, so it's going to take a while, but we're working on it. So it takes place in between Independence Day and a, another audio, a big finish audio that will be coming up to actually in not too long, uh, entitled The Genocide Machine, which also stars the Seventh Doctor and Ace, and apparently Daleks, so that's going to be fun. Yeah, it should be fun to look forward to. But yeah, when it comes to the film angle, I, I thought it was a really good story. I thought some of the twists that they threw in toward the last two episodes, I mean, they took me by surprise, I'll be honest. I mean, I talk, you would hope a twist would, but not all twists do. So I didn't necessarily see it coming, though maybe there were also some clues laid out. And there's even, I think, even an even better twist. I mean, because the cliffhanger of episode three is pretty good. But then once you get to the end of episode four, even another thing comes up. It just, I think it was done really well. And again, I think it works pretty well in audio form. And I, I think a lot of the story, fast-paced, political-based, I, I know I think it had a lot going for it, especially with this doctor. Yeah, it's one of those stories that just really fits with the type of doctor it stars. Because I can't imagine what the fourth doctor would have done in this. The fourth doctor would have just run up to Harbo and said, Hello, I th- think I'm trying to assassinate you. Would you like to come with me? And he would have just, you know, probably been arrested right there and then. I, the, see, technically speaking, I guess the Seventh Doctor wasn't arrested, but because of his, uh, well, unit contacts, he was let out relatively quickly. So, that's fun. And it's a pity we didn't get to see the Doctor actually interact with the unit in this story, but I'm sure we'll get some Seventh Doctor unit stuff in the future. But Yeah, and, uh, you said that you still think you prefer Land of the Dad, though? I think I do, because this was certainly more political than what Whispers of Terror was, but even this still felt almost political light. And maybe that means I read too much, but I thought they could have done more with, you know, some of the political angles, you know, expounding on the policies of the New, New Britannia Party. Not that we could have gas most of them, but, you know, just, you know, get a bit more specifically. And overall, I don't know, I just, I, I, I did hate the story. I, I quite liked it. Like I said, there are some amazing scenes, but amazing scenes just don't make a story. It depends on how it all comes together. And I thought there were some bits of this that just didn't work as well for me. So Ergo just didn't come as you know, did it come to God as well for me than say the land of the dad did, which is, you know, strange because I certainly like the Sabbath Doctor more than like the fifth doctor. But I just think that this toy worked really I mean this toy worked really well with the Seventh Doctor too. I think that uh the Land of the Dad just uh, worked more cohesively with the fifth doctor. And was just more cohesive in general, I suppose, than this story might have been cohesive. But as Michael said, I still really liked a lot of the um, twists, especially in the last episode. The final cliffhanger for episode three, which I suppose we aren't going to go into, but was very good, very exciting. And I certainly would not be opposed to giving this one another listen. But as a first listen, it just wasn't, you know, my absolute top tier favorite. Still really good, though. Yeah, one thing I wish I got went into a little more was exactly what Mick Thompson's deal was. And he's, again, the shock jock that the Doctor sort of enjoys pushing up early on. He does appear a decent amount in episode three. And sort of, yeah, sort of doing underground reporting with the riots. And in a way, it's sort of presented that he's sort of facing the people that he himself has helped riot up. He's sort of facing the consequences of his own radio show. So the you know the idea is hey is that going to change him down the line seeing what he's sort of created, and I think that now that they don't focus that much necessary time on it, but I did sort of like the element, but I still wish it went a bit deeper into Mick Thompson as a character. Yeah, that would have been fun. I certainly would su- would have supported that, but I suppose they only had so much time, and I get that there were all the more important things to do. I just wish there was a bit more of a conclusion to that than there and- might have ended up being. Yeah, but as far as the uh, voice acting goes. The only other one I wanted to mention, well, I, I guess I should mention Hugh Waters again, who voiced Roderick Allenham, being a campaign manager for Sherilyn Halber. I think he was a really good voice. I did a very upper-class British feel to him, a very posh voice going for him. And I also liked his sort of um, blunt ideas that, oh, hey, he might not necessarily agree with this party. It's just a job to him. Yeah, that and was I, pretty funny. Yeah, that, that was some quality stuff. Uh, Jacqueline Pierce voiced uh, Sherilyn Halber, 
and I thought she did a good, pretty good job too. Yeah, she sounded like the type of, not to be stereotypical, but she sounded like the type of political conservative woman well, who would be a, you know, a heart of one of these parties. Just very, well, again, she was also quite past sounding. She gave the, the speeches you would expect her to give. And they were not speeches I particularly agreed with. I think I disliked her as much as Ace did, maybe even more. And it's, actually, it's actually sort of funny the way her character ends up too. Yeah, she did it quite of a happy ending, alas. But yeah, I think the film manga is pretty good. I, I would, on the whole, still say Whispers of Terror is probably better, but I think the film manga worked really well. Ace and the Seventh Doctor is a companion doctor pair I really like. And this story I thought worked really well with them. So I think it's definitely I think it's definitely worth a listen, especially since it's only at least in the US it's just under four dollars. Yeah, granted you could get a tasty cheeseburger for that money. Oh you get the seventh doctor and ace and we both know which is about the deal. Yeah, which has more nourishment for the mind. This is true. So Michael, what do we have coming up next? Well up next we are going back to New Who. And watching the first two parts of the series has to offer being Aliens of London and World War Three. So we get to see Christopher Ackerson back in action. And that should be fantastic, as he would say. Yes, he would. Indeed. So yeah, that was our thoughts on the film manga. Naturally, you can follow us on Twitter if you want. We are just at Brothers Mahoney. If you've listened to this one or have any different thoughts, just let us know. We would certainly be curious to see what you thought about this one. But as always, I am Michael. And I am James. We are the Brothers Mahoney, and we will see you later. Have a nice day.